I'm gonna make it, and y'all know why I'm gonna make it? Because I wanna make it. A young woman excited for the future had her life cut short in Pennsylvania when her ex-boyfriend allegedly chased her down and fatally stabbed her. And part of the assault was seen by an eyewitness a police officer. We're diving deeper into this case with Brookford, North Carolina Police Chief Will Armstrong. Welcome to Sidebar, presented by Law and Crime. I'm Jesse Weber. Okay, so prosecutors in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, they have filed a long list of charges against a 23-year-old man named Trevor Weigel, who they say broke into his ex-girlfriend's home, chased her outside, and then proceeded to stab her more than a dozen times. And what is particularly sad about the death of this woman and this story is the age, the age of this victim. Jaden Batista was just 19 years old. In fact, in 2022, she posted a video on her Facebook page expressing her excitement about turning 18. I turn 18 in September. I turn 18 in September and I got a job and I graduate. I graduate next year, next school year, I graduate. I'm going to cry. I wasn't even supposed to make it past 13, but here I am turning 18 in five, six months. That's so crazy. I wasn't even supposed to make it past 13, but here I am going to be graduating and I'm turning 18 and I got a job and I'm in one of the best places I could ever be in in my entire life, like mentally and emotionally. I'm going to make it, and y'all know why I'm going to make it, because I want to make it, because I'm, because I made it, I basically already made it, and I'm going to make it even farther, yeah. And you could just hear how happy Jaden sounds there, but unfortunately, less than two years later, she would be dead. So I want to get into how all of this played out, and there is a lot to talk about, uh, including what the officers did here. So let me bring on somebody that I've wanted to talk to for quite some time. Will Armstrong, Brookford Police Chief in North Carolina. My understanding, the youngest police chief in the whole state, 25 years old. Will, are you actually the youngest police chief, though, in the whole country? I've seen mixed reporting about that. But good to have you on. I'm not really sure, uh, as far as I know. Uh, but, but I've been told there could be some younger ones, so I'm not sure, man. But as far as I know... Yeah, yeah, you got like 18-year-olds. I'm going to trump him. There you go. I'm going to be 18 years old. That's it. I'm ready. That's it, man. That's um, glad to by the be way, here. thank you. Oh, my, our pleasure. And look, if anybody wants to know a little bit more of the backstory about Will, uh, Dan Abrams did a fantastic interview with Will about this. It's up on our YouTube page. I encourage everybody to check it out. But Will, such a pleasure to have you here. Wish it was under better circumstances because we have to talk about this. So authorities, they say Jaden was in this short relationship with Weigel. And it lasted about two months or so. The two had reportedly broken up several weeks ago. And here is Jennifer Shorn. This is the Bucks County DA uh, held a press conference that was held on February 19th, only a few days ago. Let's take a listen. It was on Friday the 16th at approximately 2.22 p.m. following a 911 call of a burglary in progress. It was reported that a white male was attempting to enter the residence through a first floor window. When the first officer arrived, as he was pulling up to the residence, he observed a man standing outside of a red Mustang with the door open. Before that officer could exit his patrol vehicle, he saw this male chase a female, subsequently tackle her and begin to stab her. Obviously, that officer immediately approached in an effort to try to stop the attack and to render aid. Yeah, you, you heard that right. Not only an alleged eyewitness to this attack, but a police officer. Will, what's your thoughts on that? I think that a lot of times, uh, just in the law enforcement community, you know, sometimes it, it, it seems that we don't get to roll up on it in progress. So it makes a huge difference when the officer is able to roll up on the crime in progress. It was a, a great... Um, thing that the officer could make it to the scene while it's going on because now not only are we acting off of the somebody's testimony but we're acting off of observing the crime happen in progress ourselves and so um you just never know what you're going to roll up on but in this case here he shows up and um he sees the crime happening he goes he sees the guy chasing the girl he i don't know wasn't clear or not did they notice he had the knife in his hand at the beginning or not um when when the pursuit 
um, the foot pursuit occurred, but um, he had to make a, a very quick decision. I don't think a lot of people get that. Like that's that's a very fast decision to make. He's chasing her. The next thing you know, he's on top of her and he's stabbing her. So yeah, how that unfolded, I couldn't imagine. But and, and um, I have to I have to imagine there's a possibility that this was captured on body cam too. Yeah, absolutely. I would I would say majority agencies use body camera body worn cameras now. So that would be something that. Um, would be interesting to see exactly how it played out because some people, I, I, you can read, you, you can imagine some people are already going to say, well, how did he manage to let this happen? Or the case may happen the officer while pursuing the guy. And in reality, it probably happened so quickly that that it, it, it was unexpected to the officer. And that's what makes me wonder if he even saw the knife in the beginning and, and how, how quickly he tried to intervene. Well, well authorities say that Jaden was stabbed approximately 15 times now all attempts to save her failed she died at a hospital um and the district attorney and the chief of police they offered their condolences to uh, Jaden's family but they also commended that police officer who had to witness this murder it was a horrendous horrible incident just imagine the first police officer responding to this situation he pulls up on a scene he sees a male brutally and violently stabbing a young 19-year-old female. He tries to take every measure he can to save her life, while other police officers give chase to this coward who was running from the scene. So, Will, uh, you know, first, this level of attack, stabbing 15 right. times, and again, it's not entirely clear. He might have pulled up, and that's when he immediately ran away. There's not maybe more he could do at that point. But 15 times? What do you make of that? 15 times is a over overreaction. So it's obviously a very violent, violent scene. And it tells me that if you can do that, and you can do it as many times as you were, you were very upset in the moment, or you just have a really, really bad uh, personality. And it was probably somebody I'd like to see what kind of criminal record he had previously to see what kind of history he's had that he would that he's out because frequently what we see in law enforcement is that people that are committing these crimes especially the violent crimes have a very violent history before in the past and so a lot of times you'll notice that this will happen and they actually have pending charges or something of that nature so it's it's very curious to wonder how he actually um was out and and what their history was i know you said they were together just prior a few months is that correct yeah they were only um, together for a short time and then broke up a couple of weeks before yeah and and, and, and it sounds and, and I'm going to get to that because we're, we talk about motive in a little. Let, let's preview that. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second because I think it plays into the charges. Before we even get into that, though, I, I have to ask you as a, as a law enforcement member yourself, they talk about this responding officer witnessing what is essentially is a murder, an alleged murder. And he is this responding officer, uh, a veteran, served two tours in Iraq, previously worked wow. in Philly as a police officer in what is said to be a high crime area, and then witnesses this stabbing. Walk us through what it's like for officers to experience that firsthand. I think that you never, I think that every time that something of that would be this drastic happens, especially in front of the officer himself, it, like I said, many times we're called to the scene, but the crime hasn't actually occurred directly in our presence, unless we're doing something like traffic violations or something of that nature that we're observing and out on patrol looking for. But in this case, you're, you're getting the call, you're, you're, you're on the way to the call, you know what to expect because you're already being told that this is the crime that's occurring in progress. So now he gets there and he's seen the crime occur. You're having to understand how you're going to react. And you, you're probably thinking about that when you get to the call, but once you actually get outside and you see this guy run, there's no more, there's no more thinking about it. You've got to make a move and every situation um, falls out differently. It plays out differently. So in this case, he's pulling up, he knows his crime's in progress, but now he's pulling up and he's seeing it take place. He's pursuing the suspect. You've got to be thinking now, once you get render eight, good. Well, well my, 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 my question is in terms of the trauma for this officer witnessing this after what a life he's had. I mean, I, I imagine r officers who respond to these situations, who many times are veterans, yeah. they have to they have to do, do they seek seek counseling i mean how difficult is it for oh, yeah. them to to go on living their life after witnessing this absolutely so like uh, in in our state a lot of the officers here get this employee assistance for um yeah. mental health 
and stuff of that nature just to make sure that we're going to be able to cope with it. We do debriefings at our agency if we have something major of that nature take place because we want to make sure that we're getting the officer help. It's important that when an officer sees something to this drastic that happens right in his presence that he may feel like he has some responsibility. He could have stopped it. He could have done this. It's normal for the human behavior for us to go back and say, we should have done it this way. We should have done it that way. And so you've got to get that help at that point. You've got to reach out and have that talk, have that talk with your, your local psychologist or whoever you can talk with at your agency or just sometimes what we notice is that officer just needs to simply sit down with other cops that have yeah. been in these stress situations and literally just have that conversation because we take a lot of the responsibility and we don't mean to, but it's, it, that's heartbreaking to imagine that he's been through all that and now had to witness this on the job, but it also is expected with the job that we perform. So it's, it's one of those things that, you know, we're constantly getting new, new ideas that agencies can implement help for officers that when we witness something like this, that we can debrief and appropriately move yeah. on so that we can continue doing our job. And not an easy thing, not an easy thing, especially if he's going to have to testify about it later on. Now, let me talk about what happened next. You mentioned the chase. So I, I can't confirm that the responding officer is the one who gave chase. What I, we do see is that there were other responding officers who chased Weigel, and they allegedly, he allegedly climbs a fence that separated the neighborhood from the interstate. And these officers reportedly saw Weigel. They see him stabbing himself in the neck as he ran, and they were able to get a hold of him. They tase him. And then they take him into custody. Walk me through that, what you make of it. You know, immediately, I think that's a very unexpected twist. Uh, it takes a lot of courage uh, to stab yourself. Uh, a lot of people, uh, especially, you know, some people will end it, they'll shoot themselves, but you don't hear very often that somebody has decided to stab themselves, especially while they're running and fleeing from police. So that takes a lot of uh, uh, courage, but it's a very cowardly act, in my opinion that uh, you don't want to face that you, you're obviously not want, willing to sit down and face the consequences that you you've done. And so now he's trying to take his own life. And, uh, you know, we tell, I tell people all the time, I have no sympathy in those kind of cases because you have called somebody their life. You've taken a, a very young female um, from her greatest days. And now you're not even willing to sit down and, and face your consequences for what you've done. And not that we would expect that because obviously your behavior was insanity. Uh, based off of what you've done, but it's 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 sickening, honestly, in my opinion, because if it, I hate to see a crime like that that definitely deserves justice end up in this 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 capacity that right. you're trying to take your own life, and now now suddenly you, the family gets no justice because you've taken care of yourself. That's not well. That's not, not, in this, not in this case. They tased him. They took him into custody, and and I'll tell you, they searched the area. Investigators searched the area. They found a bloody knife, which is believed to be the murder weapon. It was found in the direction that Weigel had run. Just another piece of evidence against him. And the district attorney, Shorn, explained what they believe happened between these two in the minutes before officers arrived at the scene. Well, what we do know, and it's particularly heartbreaking, is that Jaden was on the phone with a friend. She had called a friend and she indicated, I believe, Trevor's trying to get in the house. And that friend ended up being the 911 caller. We know that friend actually heard uh, what sounded like uh, disruption in the home and then heard Jaden's mo uh, voice be muffled. Um, so that friend is an ear witness to the events that led up to Jaden's homicide. So, yeah, now you have another potential witness to what happened. Uh, Weigel, he was treated for his injuries at a hospital. He was arraigned on Sunday on a lot of charges, criminal homicide, burglary, possession of an instrument of crime, disorderly conduct, harassment. He was denied bail. There is a little bit of a side note to this. So, and I'm curious what you think about this, Will, because D.A. Shorn explained that for the homicide charge, while it, under the law it can encompass different degrees of murder, they are going to be arguing first-degree murder. That is an intentional killing. And court documents state that on the body cam video from one of the officers, which has not been released yet, Weigel allegedly is heard saying that he found out she, likely meaning Jaden, had cheated on him, and he, quote, lost it. Allegedly said that. Now, based upon that, if that's true, if he, said, if he lost it when he caught her cheating, my, I'm an attorney, so the first thing that I thought is that his attorneys could try to argue this is not murder, this is voluntary manslaughter. Why do I say that? Well, voluntary manslaughter, unlike a premeditated or intentional killing like murder, is when you kill someone while acting under a sudden and intense passion due to some serious provocation. The classic example we've heard in law school is that 
all of us lawyers know that, is if a husband comes home, finds his wife in bed with another man, takes out a gun, and shoots her, the killer is just under, under such an intense passion, heat of the moment, he's overcome with anger, that that killing is not intentional per se, it's something less, it's, it's manslaughter. Doesn't excuse the behavior, it just downgrades it for murder. Still a serious crime. My understanding in Pennsylvania, voluntary manslaughter is punishable up to 20 years. But Will, the problem with that, and tell me what your thoughts are, is that he didn't just discover the cheating, but apparently knew about it, went to the house to attack her. And I, I think that separation of time, I'm curious in your experience how you've seen it, because we see, unfortunately, a lot of this happened in domestic violence situations, um, yeah. this kind of violence. But but walk me through. You think that's a plausible defense given this or not really because he, he went to the house? Yeah, I think uh, premeditation is definitely a factor there. Just due to the fact that it did not happen in the moment, like you're saying, he had time to sit, think, could have cooled off, could have made another decision. But the fact that he decided to pursue this, to come to her residence, to engage in some kind of violent activity, I would argue that I would think that that would be enough to argue the fact. In my case, I would almost understand first degree murder in that in that in that aspect, just because he did have the option to walk away, the option to retreat, he had the option to do something else. He put a plan together, he had time to think on it, and then he actually showed up to the residence to follow through with it. I will say that don't be surprised. Don't be surprised that that's what his attorneys argue, given how bad these facts are. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I could see that. I, I mean, in my experience, that, that would be something that would go through my mind. I would want to definitely go for the for the highest charge. And in that case, that would be that would definitely be that. And, and now, whether whether or not that actually um, does make it or, or manslaughter is, a, is is charged later on or, or drop down to manslaughter later on, I could see that also being a thing because of, like you said, a lot of times those are heat of the moment crimes and, and the passion is there. But in this case specifically, I think, Personally, he had time to think about it. He could have retreated. He could have done something differently. He had time to think on it. But you thought about it, and then you followed through with it because you showed up at the residence, yeah. and then you yeah. have a weapon in play. So you're you're showing up. Your motive is there. You're thinking about it, and then you carry through with your crime. Now, uh, I want to end on this note, and I want your opinion on it. So this is D.A. Shorn talking about just domestic violence in general. Domestic violence uh, touches everyone. I mean, regardless of socioeconomic levels, regardless of education, regardless of age. Um, so it's hard because I, what I want to be clear is we are not at all suggesting any failure on Jaden's part. How could one ever imagine someone they love would do this to them um, after, quite frankly, only a very short relationship? So, um, you know, it's just a wake up call to, you know, remind the community that uh, this is real. Domestic violence is real. You know, Will, yeah. do you sadly see these kinds of cases a lot? Absolutely. Um, the biggest thing with domestic violence cases is they, a lot of times, once it starts, it seems to be a trending behavior that just continues. The victims never seem to, it's very, it's very, it's not, in my case, from what I see in law enforcement, it's not frequent that the victim separates themselves from the offender. They like, it's, it's a, a victimology type thing where they feel as if, you know, it's their fault and they come up and they have a lot of other factors in play a lot of times in these cases. And it's not easy whether that the, the offender is providing, sometimes in these cases, like the offender is providing the financial support for the household or something of that nature. So the victim doesn't want to leave. And it's just so important that once you recognize that you're in a violent relationship, that you understand that what you understand what domestic violence is, whether it's emotional, whether the case is, and you understand that you need to get out of it for your safety. And, you know, one of the things that came across my mind when we were talking about this is she called her friend um, mm -hmm. to let her friend know that he was getting in the home. And it's so, so important that because sometimes that takes minutes, you know, away from the call getting away to 911 communication center and then the call coming out from the communication center to the officers on the road. And so it's so important that you contact 911 or that you can you call the source directly. That could have lost seconds, you know, in between and or minutes, you know, between her life because it does take some time to relay that information. So, you know, if you feel like you're in a dangerous situation, I grew up in a domestic household. Uh, 
I talked about that before with Dan's show, you know, my, my parents were domestics and I never quite understood how somebody could be treated one way and still go back to them. But it just happens over and over and over again. And everybody has their different reasons. Like I said, they feel dependent on that person or whatever the case may be. Um, but it's just so that we under, we need to understand exactly what domestic violence is and see those early warning signs so that, you know, the community can understand this is not a normal relationship. And a lot of times what starts off as small, like your jealousy, the jealousy tendencies that happen lead to something bigger to now, like you're being locked in a room or something. These things start off small. So it's under, it's important to understand the very early warning factors, to know where it's leading down the road. Well, I really appreciate you saying that. And I'll tell you what, we're actually going to put this up here. These are the domestic violence hotlines. There's a woman's place, 800-220-8116, and the national hotline, 800-799-SAFE. Will Armstrong, what a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Okay, everybody, that is all we have for you right now here on this episode of Sidebar. Thank you so much for joining us. We always really appreciate it. And please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Jesse Weber. I'll speak to you next time.